Hello, uh, my name is Eva Scott. I'm a, a folk singer songwriter from Dublin, currently living in Kildare. And uh, yeah, this is uh, my first ever lockdown. <laughs> <laughs> that is probably the best start I've ever had to these. My first ever lockdown, but that, that's kind of dead deadly. Um, Eva, thanks a million for taking part. Um, I suppose it's the question I ask um, everyone when I start off with, but it's kind of, you know, going to be really interesting in your case. So growing up <laughs> um, as Eva Scott, <laughs> Was the arts around you and also was it something you wanted to do very early on? Yeah, no, um, I didn't want to be a musician um, and I didn't want to be a performer because I saw how hard it was for my family. So I come from a family of musicians. My mother is a singer and a senator now called Frances Black and my aunt is Mary Black. And uh, growing up, so we used to like, my ma's job was, was constantly, I was on stage all the time. And so I grew up in venues running around playing hide and go seek in, in the Olympia Theatre and places like that and having, like those memories are unbelievable to have. But when I was growing up, I was going, no way. Like it's just, it just seemed like the hardest job and the most unsure uh, job, mm. you know? And so that to me didn't seem appealing when I was kind of coming up and kind of going, right, what do I want to do with my life? It was just so insecure that I was like, no, that's not for me. I don't want that. I want to know where I'm going and what I'm doing and, and how I'm getting wages. And, you know, I'm going to, I want to be able to have a life that's easier than that and not as difficult as that. So I went off and I started doing completely different things. Now, it wasn't, it's still creative. Do you know what I mean? But uh, I studied, I went to class to do it in Kulak on the north side and I went and I did media and communications and uh, after that I went to uh, England for a year and I studied digital media and I came home and I started in the bottom rung of working in kind of post-production houses and uh, doing edit and I was trying to train to be an editor, a television editor and then I realised that sitting in a box all day looking at a computer screen didn't really suit my personality so I went into research and I started working as an archive researcher in television and different things, production managers and stuff like that. So I was always really organized uh, in TV kind of things and I was really interested in historical documentaries. Uh, and so I was singing all the way, like all that time. Um, my confidence was fairly low with regards to singing. I always had a chip on my shoulder about where I came from and being compared to my family. And so I always told everybody I didn't want to be a singer, even though in the back of my head I did actually want to be a singer. Yeah. Um, but it just kind of came about, I was working on a historical documentary and the singer, they had this sing, one of the actors singing behind the set and he had to leave. And I was production managing at the time and they just said, if we go and sing a song, like a, a, a 1960s sad song behind the set. Um, and I sang Both Union Men at the back of the set. And uh, I didn't even know all the words I was winging it like. and. Um, the director came up to me then afterwards and said, would you sing on the soundtrack? And that was the start then. I started getting a bit more confidence and uh, I left my job and I uh, went into the bell world of being a full-time musician, which is scary <laughs> most days. <laughs> go, go back there. I mean, yeah. that, 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 that's an amazing journey, but I want to kind of start off with, I, I love that idea of, you know, a kid running around, you know, backstage, on stage, going on tour. I mean, that must have been absolutely magical. It, it really was, even thinking about it now, like the the reality of being on tour now in comparison to the childhood being on tour is so different because there's, back then you just turn up at a venue with your mom, like and she'd go straight into soundcheck and then you just go explore and like, and it was like these massive, like behind the scenes wonderland of um, theatres and places and sets and even pubs and do you know what I mean? You're just kind of like you'd be in different venues and the panto might be on. Do you know what I mean? Uh, before or after it. Like, so you'd be behind stage trying on all the stuff. Do you know what I mean? And putting on all the dames' wigs. And it was, um, yeah, it was amazing to be part of that. And then the Olympia, that's one of my major memories is because um, me and my cousins, Danny um, and Connor and Roisin, Mary's kids, we were really, really close as we were growing up because if my mom was away, Mary would step in for like communions and confirmations and things that are important that you have to have somebody there. So Mary would step in and same for Mary, when Mary's away, my mom would step in. And so that's, we went up to their house and we played in their road because we had nobody to play with on our road. We were really from South Circa. 
And so we went up and played with them and we were really, really close. So we just landed to a venue, all of us. Like, you know, Roshi was a little bit younger, uh, so she mightn't be chasing with us. But me and, and Owen and Connor and, and Danny would be pegging it around the venues and, and hiding behind seats and trying to uh, trying to get the best hiding spot as we did. And it, it really was. Uh, I was actually, because I'm kind of writing stuff out at the moment, which is for a different thing, but it's amazing to kind of think back um, about your childhood um, and how much of it affects you. Like my ma used to have musicians in the house all the time. She was in a band called Arcady. And I was looking up the video last night, like, and it's amazing to see band members like Johnny McDonough and uh, Jackie Daly, who are unbelievable stalwarts in traditional music, to be playing like on a te- old eighties television program. And there's my ma's wallpaper behind the thing, you know, from my ma's gap, like, and, the, and all of her like knickknacks that she had on the mantelpiece, you know, from my growing up, like in, in this video from a television program back in the eighties. It's really weird to see that. Like I will remember that must have happened when I was in school. But um, yeah, no, like it really was amazing. And all of those different things had a huge influence on me growing up. Like yeah. um, musicians were in and out of the house all the time, staying and Sharon Shannon would be in and out all the time. Like she, cause she was in the band with my mom. And, and then my mom brought me on the Woman's Heart Tour when I was about nine. Wow. And uh, it was just me and my ma and all the women and all the band and all the crew. And that was, yeah. Like even thinking about that, you know, you're like, what? Like, what? <laughs> that was you unbelievable. That. You get a sense, sense of that but back then though when you were not. I mean, like that's obviously a big seminal thing in Irish culture and Irish music. But did you get it? You know, was that kind yeah. of... Kind of like, yes and no. Like, I got, no, I didn't realise how big of a deal it was. This was just part of mom's job. I knew that I felt special being on it because I was kind of the only kid on the tour. So everybody spoiled me and I always felt like everybody was my friend. Do you know what I mean? Even though, like, I thought I was an equal. Like, it's funny, you know. We used to play this game called Dice and uh, everybody would play with me and I was winning all the time. Like, I was really mad. I kept, I don't know how I won all the time. And Dolores team bet me on the last day and uh, I'd never forget, like, because like, I, I, they'd all let me win. They must have let me win. I don't know. We were. It was nearly like a gambling game. I don't know. I've never played it since, but I remember it now. And you throw the dice and you try and get the numbers. And um, But like all of those memories growing up definitely had such a massive influence on me. Mm-hmm. And that's why I think I'm, I realise now after becoming a musician and what life is like is that, that being on tour is the happiest I am. Yeah. in life yeah. I'm anytime I'm away and I'm on the road I have this kind of air of I'm like breathing whereas when I'm at home I'm not really taking as deep a breath I'm like it's nice and it's lovely to be home and all but I just don't have this weight on my shoulders I'm gigging and I'm away and it just and I think it's all from being so used to growing up constantly being in the car and constantly turning up at different venues and just having the best fun ever. <laughs> so, and come here, yeah. um, in, in relation to that, I mean, like, what you, what you described there, kind of, you know, from that, and then obviously going, no, 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 that's not what I want to do, that's not what I want to do, that's not what I want, and suddenly you're doing it. Um, yeah. Was there a sense, like, were you playing and singing, like, from an early age, like, were you, were you singing back then at all? Yeah, well, yeah, I was really shy, which is really weird to even think about now because I'm not shy at all. But um, when I was growing up, I hated having to sing in sessions. So my granny, like everybody always, the main first question that I ever get asked in an interview is, Jesus, the sessions in your house, Christmas must have been unbelievable. Always, without fail. Do you know what I mean? It's always. And yeah, we had unbelievable sessions. Now, they weren't at Christmas. (laughs) And we still don't really have them at Christmas because everybody takes a break at Christmas. Do you know what I mean? We don't really want to be singing. Um, But... The weddings and the funerals and the birthday parties were always like unbelievable. Um, and growing up, and um, I was always the kid on the stairs hiding, like away, and like listening, wanting to be kind of part of it and wanting to be there. Would not the panic and the fear of being asked to sing a song was unreal, and I still get that panic now. Like my heart starts thumping sessions when it's coming around so I had to learn skills to find out how to get over that which is to do it first so now I'm like straight into a session I'm like yeah I'm singing first 
<laughs> so I get it out of the way. And then I can just relax and I enjoy everything. Like so that was that was the thing. So the, but my granny would never let you out the door without singing a song. And she taught you that if you're asked to perform a song, that it's a privilege to be asked, that you need to appreciate this privilege. If somebody wants you to sing, that you should never turn them down. And so anytime like I'm in a situation where somebody goes sings a song, even even if it's walking down the road or whatever, I automatically go into a bar or something because there's a, it's a weird situation. I think it is. I've really been ingrained in me that it's a privilege to be asked to sing. And even if it's just something small, I'll just go, yep, and I'll lash it out now. And that's my granny coming into my back of my brain. Like, that doesn't even come. My mom doesn't do that. Like, my Auntie Mary doesn't do that. They wouldn't. So they are always getting asked to sing a song. I was singing some song, Mary. <laughs> um, but they wouldn't, uh, they wouldn't sing. They wouldn't sing the way I would. I just go, oh, yeah, well, da, 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 you know, and I go straight into something, whatever they wanted, you know. Yeah. And that's definitely my granny's personality. Yeah. Even was it when, like, you know, around that time then, you were kind of in school, like, and, you know, was was kind of music in, in school? Was it kind of around, like, was it, you know, where, where were you known as someone who was into music or was it something completely separate? Yeah. Yeah, no, I was. I was definitely known as somebody who was a kind of um, able to sing. We any like any kind of school tours or anything like that. We I'd be asked to sing a song. Um, I wouldn't be singing all the time, and I wouldn't be throwing myself up there. But um, I'd have to sing a song, and they like I'd be part of like all my all we did when I was a teenager was my friends was sing in our rooms. We weren't into into fellas, and we weren't into going drinking or anything we just go to each other's houses and we'd sing and um, now we wouldn't be singing for anybody else we'd just be working out harmonies and doing all those types of things and then I kind of start as my mom <laughs> explains it I started to smell myself a little bit and then I noticed boys and then that went out the window um, and I stopped kind of practicing singing all the time like I just started to kind of sm smell myself a little bit and I started going oh what's going on over here um, and so I yeah I stopped kind of singing and then I realized that I was really into me, the idea of making uh, television and that to me was just something that was unbelievable the, the the communication and the medium of that was very magical to me um and so I just went straight into that and I always kind of sang the odd song yeah but for probably about probably about eight years I probably wouldn't have sang at all like I'd sing at the odd wedding and that was it do you know what I mean and you know I'd sing at home. Yeah. But I wasn't collecting songs, I wasn't writing songs, it was not that, like, you know. I, I had been writing songs when I was 15, and then I gave it all up, and I was like, no, no, actually, that's not the job for me now, I'm gone now, I'm, this is my new passion, and I'm gone, you know. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, but it, it, it didn't mean that I was happy, I wasn't happy. Yeah. Those period, that period of my life, I always see as a kind of a very kind of cracked, kind of, yeah, just not a happy, happy girl. In my twenties, when I was going into all of that, like I was just miserable. Um, and singing to me is the thing that actually snaps me out of any sadness now. Yeah. And, and did you? I mean, obviously, you were, you know, whereas you might have been happy, you were enjoying kind of, to presume, enjoying learning the skills of kind of TV yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. What, what was it? You know, I mean, obviously, Clash Duty, great place. We we built a lot of connections, kind of with with, with them here. It's you know, great. And a great holistic education as well. But like, as you went into your career, and you said end up sitting in a kind of you know dark room in the, in the box with, yeah. with you on the screen. When did the music start kind of tapping on the window? When when did that kind of? It was a definitely a good few years. Like you know, I didn't start like I'm not going to give away my age. Like, but yeah. like it wasn't like it wasn't until my late twenties when I started to kind of really go. Actually, you know what's happening here, you know? Um, people started to kind of ask me to sing a bit more. Um, I started to just, I started to gig with my mom a little bit. I would get up and sing with her. Um, I started to kind of embrace the idea that who I was and my identity. Whereas, because I think, I think when I was moving away from music, I went into this mode of like, I don't want to be connected to my family. Do you know what I mean? I'm away from that. And it was very kind of uh, juvenile. And it was a real juvenile chip on my shoulder that I didn't like, it was real like a teenager, like, like oh, you know, I don't want to be compared to my ma or, you know, I don't want to be like my ma. But 
growing up, mature and realizing that it's actually a compliment to be compared to my ma and that, that she's pretty amazing. Like, uh, and that kind of uh, having a bit of maturity and realizing that, um, that's who I am. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? I can't deny it. Like, and and I, uh, genetically, I'm similar to my mom and my auntie Mary, and I had to really embrace that genetically. I was sounding similar to both of them, and um, sometimes one more than the other. But mm-hmm. that's who I learned of. Do you know what I mean? So, like, why would I be denying that about myself? And why would I try to pretend I was somebody else? Why would I be anybody else other than myself? And I think growing up really just had to accept that that I had to let go of my teenage kind of, you know, oh, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not connected to my mum. My mum's not cool. Do you know what I mean? And it's actually my mum's really cool. <laughs> so but it is tricky. I mean, like I said, bad enough with kind of one parent. But your whole kind of clan, you know, that that's yeah. hard to kind of find your own space within. But when that started, yeah, with... it was tough because Danny, Danny, um, like Danny, my cousin, who's in the band the Coronas. He, you know, he knew from like day one. Like I remember when he was three, being in the middle of the session on my granny's lap singing, not even able to speak properly, and he was like <laughs> laughing out the songs. So from when he was like the born he was bound to be a performer. Like he was just, that was it. Like, and we all knew it. And there was never any other, there was never any other thinking that he would go anywhere else. Like, um, And so he, like I worked as the publicist for the Coronas when they started out. Like I was helping on their team and, you know, I was really trying to push for them. I was massively behind the scenes. I didn't really want to be in any way um, seen as a musician even back then. Um, and so then all of a sudden I have my ma, my auntie, and all the black family, which, are, you know, they grew, I grew up listening to them. And then Danny is a megastar now. Do you know what I mean? And then Roshi, like, blew up as well. And it was just like, okay, do I still, do I want to be another one? Do I want to be the one that is the shite one, basically, if you don't mind me saying. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Am I going to be the shite one? Am I going to be the one that's compared, ah, oh, she didn't make it? And it was always the fear of failure that made me not want to sing. And it was like, always going to be compared. Even in sessions, it was there was this level of like, if I sing, they're all going to think I'm crap. And I'm not, I'm never going to be good enough. So there's no point in really starting. There's no point in even trying. Yeah. And I just really learned that like, uh, being a musician isn't about that. Like, it's not about the success. It's it's about the journey that you're on, and it's about the life that you have, and the connection. That's really what I learned, and that was one of the reasons why I left my job to go and become a singer was because the medium of media and TV that I was in was so short lived. You'd spend a year and a half working on a pro- program that you just poured your heart and soul. You literally bled for the show. And it would be over in an hour on TV and that would be gone and be gone. And then people are watching something else and you're like, what? How is that possible? Whereas I found that singing, people go home after hearing you sing or tell a story or sing a song and they're still thinking about the song or they're still thinking about the story and they're thinking about what that made them feel. And that connection with people was the reason that made me change. I just couldn't, I couldn't get over how short lived I wasn't fulfilled. Mm. And the only way that I'd be fulfilled is if I was connecting with people who hadn't, who were able to come up to me at the end of a gig and go, she's that song or that story you told, like really made me think of my cousin or my friend or, you know, somebody who really touched them. And that song is connected to them with that. And they're connected to me. And that's how I, that's, that's the only thing that makes sense now anymore. Do you know what I mean? It's, Is that connection. Like, and in, re- in, in relation to that, I mean, the, you know, that decision to leave your job, to kind of go, this is who I am, you know, for that must be a huge thing, or did it come quite naturally to you? Was it kind of something you knew kind of all the no, time? No, no, oh, it was very drawn out, like, do you know what I mean? So I was living in Galway uh, and working uh, on TV car shows, and I, I had moved to Connemara, and it was like, had a fairly permanent job. I was managing a production company, and I was kind of had about, few different people kind of like I was in charge of them and um it was like okay I'm gonna give this up 
and like so giving that up was like the biggest scariest thing in the world and then I moved back to Dublin and I was like I'm gonna go and follow my dreams but like I had been I had kind of trained myself to not to stop not to stop working to be earning all the time and when you give up a job to go and start something brand new even if you're opening a cafe you're not going to be earning like you're just not going to be earning so that fear of being you know wageless and I remember going on the doll at one stage and feeling like such a failure like that it was just I can't be a musician I can't make a living at this I'm such a failure like um and so then I kept kind of taking on little jobs still in media uh, to try and pass the time but it was just filling up my time and it, it just takes up all your energy and I never made any music and I never made any album until I went right that's it I'm going to be poor this is you literally have to make the decision that you're going to be poor to be able to and that's an awful place to be in Ireland that if you want to be able to recreate it, if you want to make music if you want to be able to connect with people over that that you have to choose a different lifestyle you have to choose to you know, I lived with my my parents for a long time because I couldn't afford to pay the rent, and you know, it's just a it's just a harsh reality. But it, you know, if you put the head down and you get there, you can eventually. I'm saying that kind of very unsure because of what's going on at the moment. I'm like, yeah, I might be living with my man next month. You don't know, but um, yeah, I mean, for- no, like that's been like. It, 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 there is a belief there that you have to just put everything into it and taking all distractions away, anything that just gets in the way that made me go, right, well, I don't have anything else now to do. This is, you have to make it. And making my first album was full of fear. I was so scared about everything. It took me so long to make it because making decisions was all about, will I fail? Will I fail? Is it failure? Is it crap? Is it, you know, and... I didn't know who I was either. And I still don't know who I am, but like it was all about, I wanted to be about who I am. Yeah. And then um, it's, it's really hard. To, you just, it's really hard to, to be able to do that. Like, you know, to decide who you are in one album. Like, yeah, but uh, I did my best and I, I definitely made an album all the time. It was actually, uh, you know, Maraidney Waney from Alton. Mm. She, I was working on a television show. I was driving her around the country uh, as she was a presenter of a television show, and she said to me, "For their snapshots in time, do you know what I mean? You just have to think that like that's you during that period. It's not about you as a whole. It's not about your whole identity. It's not about trying to pour everything. It's a snapshot in time. It's just that part. That's what you made that day. That's what you made that month. That's what you made that year. And you just move on to the next thing. And that freed me up to just go, okay, yeah. that's fair enough. You know, that's just fair enough. If it, like I mean." And in a way, thank God you did um, for all the, the for all the rest of us. But I think there's something that you you said there, which kind of a lot, a lot of these conversations. And for anyone that kind of finds this in the depths of the internet in ten years' time, we're speaking kind of in the midst of a pandemic where we're all in kind of you know lockdown in in a way. And you know, I think for the arts and I suppose for the performing arts, particularly for musicians and theatre makers and dancers, it's it's a kind of yeah, it's a huge um, space of kind of going. How the hell are we going to have that? connection um in, in yeah the, but when you were writing that first out i mean again I, th- I think as well like the tradition that you're in and that you came from you know the writing piece seemed to have become a huge part of who, who you are over the years and that kind of emerged yeah. Fully. yeah it's a it's a kind of a hard one because i even when i made the second album which just came out in january i still have to have songs that aren't mine but that are kind of passed on do you know what I mean? So I still have to, I still feel like I have to be that storyteller that I, even though I'm writing my own songs, that I have to be able to pass on these other stories that happened that, that people might not know about, like, you know, and maybe people might not, might know about them as well, but this is my take on that story. And I think that that's a kind of a hybrid of where I came from, which is like my mom and Mary, they weren't really gone down the road of songwriting too much. Um, I don't find it the easiest thing in the world to do either. Like, I don't find it, like, very natural that I just want to write songs all day. I just find it kind of difficult in that sense. But I do feel like it's um, part of who I am that it has to be at least half and half, if I can, do you know what I mean, be able to pass on the older songs and pass on the writing songs. But it wasn't until I, I, I got stuck in a rut last year, and it wasn't until I read a book called The War of Art by Stephen Pressfield that made me just go, okay, I'm going to write my new album now. And that was it, like, I just... 
pour it out of me and it, and I still have to, I have to read it again. I'm putting it off. I'm putting it off reading it at the moment in the lockdown because I'm kind of like, I have to start working. Like, I'm like, you better start writing songs, Eva, because, you know, sooner or later, this won't, this time won't be here. And I'll be like, why didn't I write any good songs? Um, but it's hard, you know, it's hard to put pressure on yourself in this situation to be going and going, you better write a song, you better write a good song. And um, uh, I just think that it, I, I, I commend anybody who's doing amazing work in the lockdown, but I feel like the pressure of the anxiety uh, gets in the way sometimes. Yeah. Um, but if you can get, if you can get rid of it and try to do something creative, that's what the War of Art is about, though. Right. That's that book. It's very good it's for anybody who's stuck. It's very good. It's very good. Yeah. yeah. When, like, when you started, like, gigging your own stuff and and kind of, you know, sort of, sort of, not just your own stuff, but your your own voice and kind of taking, like, were you? I mean, obviously taking your family away from. But was there other kind of folk artists that you would be being heavily influenced by? Yeah, I mean, Damo was a major, like, unbelievable. Like, I used to follow him around the country. I was mad about how he performed, how he wrote songs. Um, and, like, I do a cover of The Colony, um, and he's always really freaked out by that. Like, he's like, how is a woman singing The Colony? He's just, like, doesn't understand it, like, you know. But I'm like, yeah, it's fucking more powerful. Do you know what I mean? Like, it's fucking dead. Um but like the fact that he wrote from the heart and um, didn't really care what people thought of him and yeah. sang in his own accent. Like he is a trailblazer in that sense, I think. You know, because um, I followed him, like I used to work as an usher in Vicar Street and I'll never forget the first time I ever saw him. I'd heard him, I'd heard the first album, They Don't Teach the Shit in School and I'd heard it up in town. But uh, I wasn't really that like, you know, blown away until I saw him support Sinead O'Connor in Vicar Street. You're talking, I'm not even talking about the dice there. But uh, I was just like, this fella is unbelievable. And I saw him three nights in a row. And the fact that he just did his own thing and he didn't care about anybody else. And he just sang from the heart and he sang the words that literally were in his head. You know, he's not trying to fake the words. He's not trying to make them sound fancy. He's not trying to, you know what I mean? It's just, this is what comes out of his soul. And that is a soul that we're listening to. And that to me was just like, you know, it's it's very easy to get caught up in the whole writing of a song and to be like, maybe that's too obvious or maybe that's too basic. And, you know, maybe we need to complicate it a little bit more just to make it more interesting. But like, Damo just came from the heart and he just sang what he was feeling and what he believes in. And I just think that that to me just blew my mind. And that's why I was thinking, you know, the themes of both albums and my album, my first album, my second album, they are who my um, my personality, you know, there's going to be songs of social justice on there on both albums. There's, there's uh, Gaelic songs because Irish is really important to me as a language. We were making the second album in Nashville last year and uh, we had, um, we had this chance to go and work with uh, Ron Block and I was over there and I just couldn't, we were meant to do songs from the Liberties over there, right? That's, this is, we had written all these songs about the Liberties where I'm from and when I got there I was like, I can't, I can't record them here in Nashville. I feel like I'm wrong, there's something wrong here. So we ended up writing songs out there and that was amazing. But by the end of the finish I was like, there's no Gaelic here, like this isn't right. And so I have to make sure that there's always part of my my soul on the album in that sense and Greg is a huge part of my soul and uh, and so there's like social justice family and love and place generally Ireland is a huge part of my inspiration so um it's uh yeah so he he's been a massive influence and then Alison Krauss uh was somebody that I saw in the early 2000s she's an American singer a bluegrass singer and then um she was playing with Union Station and then we happened to bump into Ron Block at a gig in Scotland and then we got to make my second album, when, which was wow. a dream come true. Unbelievable, yeah. Really amazing. Can't believe that still. That's incredible, you know, kind of meeting someone and then you're, suddenly you're all over in Nashville, you know, re recording. Um, but yeah. I, might, I might kind of take, take you back to the, you mentioned there earlier on about that sense of connection and playing. Like, like but when did you, could you hear the passion in you when you're kind of talking about performance? And I think that's all mm -hmm. I'm in talking to musicians about the recording process and the playing live process and yeah they're, they're very different obviously but that that connection with, with an, an, an audience like you just talk about that for, for, for a second particularly in in, yeah. in where you come from and kind of the area of social justice and that kind of you know having people in front of you 
yeah. Um, it's a funny one because I hate recording albums. Like, that's why I only got two. Um, because I don't have, like, I, I literally see it as a, a spiritual experience, if I don't mind you saying. It's kind of um, weird how I, um, I feel like this, this kind of, these either colors or kind of a, an energy comes out of my heart. And it comes out over the microphone <laughs> into the audience and, and meets all these other colors from other people. And that's how I literally see it. If I'm having a bad gig, you know, um, sound is not going great. And if somebody's talking or something like that, like um, I tap into this kind of uh, thing that I have, which is about gratitude as to where I am because I spent so long not being on a stage. And that just opens up this kind of beam of light from my chest and that's how I feel it. it is like and I feel like that connection is the most important important re reason why I'm doing it as a job you know it's so hard it's such a hard job to do you could go and you know go back and, and sit in an office all day and you know you could probably get a mortgage with that kind of job and which I'll never probably ever get but like um that's that's the be all and end all for me that's the most important part of my career of my job it's that literally that moment and when it feels like the biggest high you could possibly get do you know what I mean it's just there's nothing nothing else like it and you feel like you're floating over the audience and you can feel the love being received and them giving it back to you it's mental it's really mad you can think talk about it now like it's really mad I don't spend very long time talking about it to people but it, it is that that's when it is the best part of my life it's the best it's the best of anything that could ever happen is that moment and that's why you have to be real careful because you know people can get really low from having those experiences because it is a drug it's a magical thing it's a drug in the sense that um it's so out of body that you want to do it all the time and then you get lows after it so the first few years when i went gigging full time I was getting massive lows after it and uh, I couldn't understand why so I'm doing it, I'm living my dream, why am I so sad? Um, but it is that, it's just because it's so amazing and then all of a sudden you're not. Yeah. And you can see why so many artists and musicians have to go to other things to be able to survive it. Do you know what I mean? Because it's just, it's such um an out of body thing that you just can't the reality of the real world is is a weird place after it like um and it's not a nice place sometimes so there's a lot of uh you have to be very self-aware to make sure that you know what's going on and that this uh low after it isn't actually a real reality you know it's just because you had such a good high so and yeah. you just, like wait, 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 like not very not very long after you kind of start. I mean, you kind of start developing a huge, particularly in in Europe and, and America, very early doors. I mean, I think was that something like you, you you've given an awful lot and won accolades and won awards in the states. You know, was that something that yeah. that that kind of were those audiences? You know, early very receptive to your work, kind of uh, from from, from an, an area. Yeah, America's well, America's a mad place. <laughs> it's like, um, it's 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 more magical. Um, as an audience they are so open and willing to accept the energy that's going on that the highs of those gigs are unbelievable um, it's 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 I don't know why but they just don't have I think Irish audiences are are fairly hard to please you know um, and you kind of have to win them over there's a bit of work do you know what I mean so they're Ireland is a different place in the sense that we have so many amazing um, artists and so many musicians that somebody's cousin or somebody's uncle could be a better singer than you. Do you know what I mean? Because that's just the reality of the country that we come from. We come from a country of, of artists and poets and you kind of, you walk into a, a venue and they're kind of sitting there going, okay, show us, show us what you're going to do here now. I'm ready, you know, I'm ready to be convinced. Whereas in America, um, you kind of go and it just, they're already hugging you within seconds. So there's, there's a lot less work to do because of this. They don't have this try and, try and convince me to, to like it. Do you know what I mean? They already like you when you walk in, which is a very easy gig to do, but uh, it's definitely magical. Yeah, it's amazing. And then like, for, you know, in the last few years, you've won, you know, many awards, you know, accolades, which are kind of, I mean, I, I know that they don't mean everything, but they're certainly special no. receives them and, you know, 
to receive stuff like you know the best folk act re- re- like last year was kind of an, an extraordinary thing I'd imagine that happened to you. Yeah, I mean, the, the awards are amazing, particularly when you're in a low point of your career. If you're feeling like, you know, you're not really moving forward, when you get an award like that, it really does give you a lift. Like, um, At the same time, they don't really mean huge amounts um, to the reality of your career. Like, it doesn't mean that you're going to get bigger gigs. It doesn't mean that you're going to get more gigs. It, it, it means that uh, you feel a little bit more belief in you, maybe that you're doing the right thing a little bit. Yeah. You know, it gives you that little bit of credibility. It doesn't give you, it doesn't open any, I don't think it opens any doors at all, to be honest. I think it does look good on a bio. <laughs> um, and uh, in that sense, you know, we're kind of, I'm lucky to be able to have those types of things to say. But, you know, um, I'm just lucky that sometimes I'm in the right place at the right time and I give my album to the to the right person at the right time. And um, I think having all that kind of background in, in production uh, helped me kind of get to where I am today as well. Well, I wouldn't underestimate the power of your singing and your writing and, and your <laughs> well, even. Well, I'm not going to let you do that. Um, and also then, you know, kind of songs that you have written or been part of have had kind of, you know, huge recognition, like the Wild Atlantic Way. That kind of went went, went bang for you. I mean, yeah, you it did, yeah. That was a mad thing. Um, and, you know, it was very magical that it got, it got so kind of popular. It was played a lot on Radio 1 and um, uh, it went, we sang it on the Late Late Show and it was amazing like, cause, you know Late Late Show in Ireland, like it's the be all and end all, you know, so if you're starting off as a, as a, as a musician or anything, if you get the Late Late Show for the first time, you're like, oh my God, where's me granny? Both grannies are passed away at this stage, do you know what I mean? But like, you're like, this is, this is it, like I've made it, this is it, like nothing else is going to top it, like, so when we got to sing the Wild Atlantic Way on Late Late Show, I was walking around like it was me Wednesday. You know what I mean? I was just like, this is the most amazing, you know, and because like you're kind of the young, you know, on the Late Late Show, they have you in from like 12 o'clock in the day or 11 o'clock in the day. Like so you're in RT all day, like you're hanging around and you're like, oh, yes, hello. And you're like talking to the people in the canteen. Do you know, I'm on the Late Late tonight. I'm on the Late Late tonight. And uh, it's just like the, the really the biggest deal in the world and so you when you look back at that clip of me on the Late Late Show I have the biggest smile on my face because it literally looked like my wedding day where if I ever got married to that I'd be like <gasps> oh, and it was just I was so nervous as well um singing Wild Atlantic Way and that's the thing actually going back to audience and the connection right that I was going to be performing all along the Wild Atlantic Way in front of an audience but they didn't know the song well they did I could usually I teach everybody the song so they sing it back right so the main thing that for me and having that connection like is that listen we're all on our holidays here singing this song like do you know what I mean you all have to think about where you are on your holidays if we get to be going to all these places like so I asked the producer beforehand it's like any chance you let me go out before the show starts and teach them the song and so and then I was able to talk to them and connect with them a little bit. And so then that makes me connect. Do you know what I mean? That makes me connect with myself because if they're connecting with the song, I'm connecting. And the more that they're buzzing, the more that I'm buzzing. And then it just becomes a break crack. Do you know what I mean? Because if they're looking at going, who's your one here coming out? Like they never heard me before. They wouldn't have known the song or whatever. And uh, so that in itself was an amazing connecting um, and having audience members who've never heard the song before kind of clapping in the audience, singing along with me. And uh, that was the best crack ever. It was really amazing. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good song. It was a scary song to kind of put out first and then to try and make a second album after it doing so well on the radio. That was another thing that used to, was really holding me back. I was like, what do I do next? Do you know what I mean? Because I didn't release another single after that one because I didn't know what to do. Like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, and then even making a second album, you're like, I don't have anything that's as, you know, repetitively catchy as <laughs> all along the world in lots of way. <laughs> that would drive people mad if they keep hearing it too many times. I don't have one of those on my second album. Yeah. Um, but it's just about accepting that and really remembering that it's a snapshot in time. That it, uh, That's what it is and you have to... You know, but the problem with it is, is these snapshots and times, they cost 20,000 euro to make these days. So um, that's so that's a real problem. It would be amazing if you could just make all these snapshots and times and not be worried about the cost at all. But um, yeah, so that's, it's, yeah, yeah it's, it's a mad journey. Yeah. And Aoife, um 
the sense then of, I mean, you know, I think having seen you live, that it's way more than singing songs. You know, it, it's that, you know, it's that uh, at the heart, I think you're kind of through to whatever medium you're a naturally a natural born story, storyteller. It, it, it's kind of about that, that in, in, in engagement. And I think that's, that's what, yeah. that's what puts you apart. I think that's what really what's special about, because you want the audience to be up on the stage with you. Yeah. I want them kind of to be on this journey with me. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Like, so I'm like, come on, like, till I tell you, and I'll show you this, right? Come here till I tell you. This. So that's what the stories beforehand are because, when I'm singing the song, I'm I'm there in those places. So like I my eyes are closed, you know, like Christy always said the lyrics in the back of his eyes. But it's not the lyrics, it's like a little film playing in the back of my eye, eyelids, like. So my eyes are closed and I'm singing a song and that's I'm there. Like I'm all those places in the wild and anti way. I'm on Grafton Street in Dublin Center, wherever I'm singing about, that's where I am. I'm on my holidays like and or else if I'm singing about heartbreak, I'm there, I'm feeling the sadness that I used to feel like. But for me to get the audience with me on that journey so they can see the film going on in the back of my head, <laughs> I have to explain where it comes from and why I'm singing it and uh, why I wrote it or why I chose to sing it and where the background is and what I'm feeling when I'm singing it. So like the Dublin Saunter is the Dublin Can Be Heaven song and that's on my uh, new album and that came from my granny, my nana Scott, who couldn't sing at all. She didn't know no notes in her head at all but she I remember being eight in her kitchen and she had one of those houses that had no heat and even till she died she had no heat but the kitchen was the warmest places in the house and she used to go in and uh, we'd, we'd sit in there and she'd be making the dinner and she'd be listening to Rowan Collins and she'd have this uh, she'd do this dance she'd pick up the dog and she'd do this kind of thing with her mouth I don't know if that's an old people thing but it's a high hat like I realised it was a high hat you know it's, Anyway, but well, I never forget her singing Dublin Sandra to me. She sang Dublin Can Be Heaven. And I remember being really young going, Jesus, this is a very magical song now. And so when she was kind of getting old and she was in a nursing home, I'd go down to her and she, she wouldn't really realise where she was, but I'd sing that to her and she'd always come back to me and give out to me about saying the wrong words. Or whatever she was. <laughs> but uh, it, to me, that's who, that's who I'm with. I'm walking in grocery with my nana on a Sunday when I'm singing that song. And that's the connection that I have. And I always tell the story about where I learned it and who, and her kitchen and how cold it was. Yeah. And that's real, really important part of it for me, you know. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when you talk to actors, it's the same thing as about having a, a reality for yourself on stage. And people sense, people when you're looking at you, sense that reality and kind of, you know, can go along on that journey with you. I, mean, I, won't, I won't keep you from for much longer. Just a couple more things I just want to ch chat about. The, I mean, the album Homebird, I mean, it's out now and, and available. But again, it's it's... It's a beautiful piece piece of work. I mean, I remember seeing you actually. Um, God, it was at the Lou Kelly. Um, oh yeah. The Liberty. I mean, that was just an absolute phenomenal night in in Liberty. Unbelievable, Liberty. yeah. But um, yeah, but that again, that sense of a tradition, and I think your your album, your your music kind of floats between, say, the Irish folk tradition and the American kind of folk tradition esque. You know, yeah. that sense of Nashville. You know, that kind of um wider kind of folk palette that they have but i think there's there's something that um there's something that's that's completely authentic and, and you about your work and it's kind of it's bizarrely like what you mentioned for me what you mentioned there earlier about like your your nana and the, the liberties and that kind of very specific dublin and is that, yeah. is that, that, that that area is still very much part of your kind of soul and kind of makeup oh uh, yeah it's massively i mean we haven't been we live in Kildare because we can't afford to live in Dublin, right? So we got really lucky we found a house that we can afford to rent out here. But we live in the middle of nowhere. And so we haven't seen anybody since um, before we went to America in early March. And we haven't been to Dublin in early March. And that's mental. Because I would be there three times a week. And I go home to my mom and dad. And I cycle around the Liberties. And it's one of the things that keeps me sane. I take my dad's bike and I just head out. And I drive down Mead Street and I drive down Cork or I cycle down Cork Street and I cycle around Thomas Street and I just smell it and I feel it and it just fills me up with the reality of who I am and where I'm from. And now being in the countryside, obviously in Ireland, has that same element to it, but it's not the same because the smells of the liberties are different. Some days you get the smell of the hops again, it's like not as often as you used it, but that smell and there's this kind of crispness of the 
before the bars open, you know, that smell of old pub, that's just, I think it's beautiful. Because <laughs> it's, it's fucking rank as well. Like, you know, for anybody that isn't from Dublin, they don't know what it is, you know, but there's just that smell of, you know, the pours, the melody Guinness that fell on the carpet, like, and it's just, the door would open as they're bringing in barrels and, and you just hear everyone shouting at each other. And to me, that's part of who I am. It's such a huge part of it that I just feel like I'm trying to work. We're working on songs from the Liberties now. That's what I was saying. We were meant to go and record some of those songs. But when I got to Nashville, I was like, no, we're not doing it over here. Absolutely no chance. And if anything, we have to be as close to the Liberties as we possibly can. Um, because to me, it's that's just a huge part of my soul. It's like, it's like the Irish language. It's like social justice. It's just, but it's actually nearly half of me. And because I'm away so much, I feel it much more and definitely haven't seen it or I've been around it. Like, um, so Frankie Gaffney put up a picture of the canal the other day, like, and it was all overgrown and melody and, you know, gammy, like, you know, but I just got this like, <gasps> oh my God, the canal when it's overgrown and it hasn't been cut back, like, and you just can't see past it. Like you're trying to walk through it, like, and the, the weeds are up to above your head, like, and it just made me really homesick. And it's funny to be homesick when you're living in Kildare. <laughs> but that's what the that's what the the new reality of the lockdown is. Yeah, yeah. And could yeah. we just hit, hit me back, will you? But talking about your family there and your cousins and say around the centenary, you know, Grace and that yeah. that, that must have been a phenomenal to do, was it? With with with, with Danny and Ro Roisin. Yeah, it's a funny one because, like I said, like I I'm the I'm the kind of historian in the family, right? So, and I had been working on historical documentaries. So Roche rang me, or I think I was up with the gaff for some reason, and she said, "Ifa, I've been asked in Grace." Um, I'm asked to sing a song for the centenary, and she goes, they've asked to do it as a duet with Danny. And I was like, you can't sing a duet with your brother. I was like, that's a romantic song. That's mental. Like, and they were laughing at me like, I was like, oh, that'd be weird. And so then they were trying to figure out a new way, and then she just rang me, and she's like, do you think you want to do it with us? Like, so the three of us sing together. And I was like, oh, yeah, that sounds all right. Then it's a family thing rather than a, a romantic kind of, you know. And um, so then we practiced it twice or something. And the day that they were recording, it was the day of my album launched in the Workman's Club, my first album. Okay. I'd go down to the main, and, and it was funny. Some of the cameramen I used to knew, I knew from back when I used to work. Like, and we, I think we practiced it twice or something. I went down, did my sound check to Workman's, and then I came back and I went into Kilmainham, and that was really magical. Like, the actual feeling of it was amazing to stand at the doors and sing with my cousins. <laughs> There's nothing really like it in the world. There's nothing like it. And we sang it again in Vicar Street when the Cromans did play in Vicar Street on a, a Christmas. And that was unbelievable for me because I used to be an usher in Vicar Street. I'd stand on the stage and singing it with them. It's it's just, there's nothing like singing with your family. It really isn't. And particularly my two lovely cousins because they're the loveliest creatures in the world. And um, they kind of, even though I'm their older cousin, they kind of treat me like their younger cousin a little bit. So they were always giving me those cuddles when I come off stage. And uh, it's just to me, and I'm really proud of them. Like I spend most of Corona's gigs crying, um, when especially when it's like amazing music going on. I'm like, oh my god, he's so amazing, he's so amazing, I'm so proud of him. And then Danny's like, come, Danny, come up after me because how the hell did I get on? And I was like, oh yeah, ball, great gig. Once I'm balling, you know, it's it's a good gig, like really good gig. But I'm not, the day I'm not balling, you know, the Corona's are shy. So. <laughs> uh, before I let you go, t talk to me about the Ar Irish language, Aoife, in, in relation to yeah. um, what you're saying is kind of a huge part of, of your makeup. Is it something that you use the whole time? Is it kind of, you know, where does that come from? <laughs> it's a funny one because I'm not using it as much, but um, I guess um, I went to an all-Irish school, so we went from South Circular and I got two buses every day out to Slargan to um, an all-Irish school and then afterwards when I went, when I was in college and I was working at Dulig, I was working in an all-Irish cafe. And then I just ended up working in a lot of Irish language programming. And it just became such a big, big part of who I am. And it's um, something that I'm really proud to have. And I miss the language and I'm not speaking it. I haven't been speaking it in a while. Cahal, who's our band, he's from Guidor. Um, he's fluent Irish speaker. He's, um, he's only finished college yesterday but um i don't, can't speak irish to him because it's irish is too complicated <laughs> but um you know when i'm out in the road you get to speak a bit more irish and you really miss it so it's really like listening to the radio in the belt it's, it's watching tg car and it's it's really being surrounded by it and trying your best to 
to make sure that it's there, but keeping it alive and seeing things that people are making online through Irish in the lockdown has been amazing as well because, you know, it really makes me feel very proud of who I am. It's really part of, of my culture and my heritage and I'm very lucky to have it. And similarly, the, the area you mentioned a few times was kind of social justice. I mean, those kind of, you know, one of, one of the pillars of your work. Is that something that kind of, you know, obviously it comes out through your writing, but is that something that is very important to you in your day, in your li li lived life? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really important. Well, I think it's really important if you're going to have a platform at all to, um, to be able to talk about the important things, which are injustices in particular. And I think that when you're singing and you're talking about lovely things and it's all very lovely and you're happy out, you know, you need to talk about the reality of the situation. And when I talk about the reality, you know, Homebird, the album, is that about a song um, that's written about where we live now. But what I do when I'm explaining the story, I go, well, the reason that we live where we live, which is we're very lucky to live here, we just couldn't afford to live in Dublin and the prices in Dublin is ridiculous. And being a musician, you, you literally get a state age just putting down the phone to you. So I always have that little bit of reality when I'm telling a story about a nice thing or a beautiful thing. There's actually the other side of it as well. And, you know, people need to know about the realities for of, you know, artists, of people who are really struggling at the moment. And I think that only thing that I can think that's good about the lockdown is that, you know, it's shining a light on the minorities that are really struggling right now. And particularly when you look at the healthcare workers, like, do you know what I mean? When they're struggling for so long to try and live on what they're living on. And now look at them, we're all relying on them. like. And so I think the only thing that I can think of when you're not thinking selfishly about yourself, <laughs> you know, because you can think, oh, the poor musicians and the poor artists, and it is, you know, we're, we're going to have to work really hard. I was thought about it this morning, like, we're going to have to fight, you know, I think we're going to have to really fight because they're not going to, we're they're going to be the last to th be thought of, like, we're going to be the last person to be thought of. And um, it's, you know, we have, we have to wait, I think, to see how this lockdown lifts then we're going to have to fight for who we are and fight for our identities and fight to 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 make sure that we're looked after and put first as well because otherwise um we'll be forgotten about yeah. and we don't want to be we don't want to be that country that used to be full of poets and scholars and musicians we want to still keep it going and, and uh make sure that we look after the people who are keeping everybody else sane <laughs> i think i hope i hope people are keeping being sane by music yeah. Just, I agree with you, it's a conversation and a fight that kind of, you know, we're all involved in at the moment, but just so you know, I think you're, you speak very eloquently about that, and I think it's, it's you know, it's a bit of a, it's a, bit of a leader in you as well, Aoife, around, around as, no, because I, I, I do think that the more, the, the more we speak about it through the lockdown, and the more, I mean, part of the reason for starting these ag access chats were around, around the general public kind of knowing about what artists, do as you know, that artists are normal people too, you know, that it's kind of sense that yeah. Yeah. People sometimes think that people who gig or make albums or they're all grand, they're living there and they're fine, they're making a living. But actually, you know, if you can't play live, that's a no. massive problem. You know, one of my major, one of my major fears, you know, as, as lucky, like I feel very lucky to be, have received the COVID payment. Do you know what I mean? Like, I feel like I'm one of the lucky ones because some musicians wouldn't be, they just get rejected. Do you know mm -hmm. what I mean? So we're kind of like, we're always on a week to week basis. We're always like, okay, how are we going to pay the rent this week? You know, always. Like, that's always reality. So we have the COVID payment. But then when it comes to job seekers, I'm like, are they just going to reject me? What's going to happen? I'm ringing me ma. Like, I'm going, mom, what's, what am I going to do? Like, what am I going to do? Because it's not going to be, yeah, COVID payment is over. We're all going back to work. We're not. Do you know what I mean? We're not. And what are we going to do? Like, we, there, there needs to be a plan put in place and there, we need to talk about it. We need to have discussions. I think, I think there's, we have to be sensitive to where we talk about it because yeah. at the moment, with people still passing away, we can't be aggressively going forward and going, what about us? Because when there's so many people passing away, you can't talk about us. You can't. You have to wait. And hopefully that all will get better and we won't nobody will be passing away then we can go right what's the story here now because we need to talk about us and you know talking about a leader i don't think i am a leader but if I, if you do think i am it's because i didn't lick it up off the ground as my man says so like i think uh, you know i 
I never really, I don't really ever get very vocal um, in, on social media and stuff like that because I don't feel very confident about it. It's only when I'm talking in a conversation. Um, and it, I'm not sure. I think there's always a fear of, of people not really being on your side. But I've always been, when I'm talking about stuff on stage, I always go, this is what I believe in. This is, this is who I am and this is what we should be fighting for. You know, and you like there's so many things going wrong at the moment in the country, and like that's the thing I say. I go around the world and I'm talking like because we gig most of the way, time away. We don't gig in Ireland as much, and I'm like Ireland's a great place, but at the same time we have a lot of problems. Like we have an awful lot of problems. We've huge men. I always say this on stage, like, and uh, like I don't care. I don't, I actually don't care because I think about all the beauty of it all the time. I think about how beautiful it is, I, and I talk about how much I am in love with the country, but I go. We have to fight for who we are. We fight for our culture and our music and our language. And that's who we are as a country. We've had to fight for years for that. And we still have to fight for things. And we have to fight for mental health. We have to fight for the things that, like, you know, we need to be looking after direct, like, we need to end direct provision. Like, that's just unbelievable what's going on at the moment. And we're going to look back in 20 years, 30 years' time going, what? How did we let that happen? How? How did we let that happen? How did we let anybody be homeless? How? I really hope that we will be looking back on. Yeah. I hope it hasn't gone back on. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. So yeah, you let me on a rant there, Mark. Not at all. Um, not, not, that's far, see, that, that, I think that's far from a rant. That's, that's the truth. That's the reality that we're kind of living in. Eva, yeah. um, thanks a million for taking part in this. And just so you know, I mean, you were due to play here, God, in mid-June. And unfortunately, yeah. Monday, yeah. Postponed. I mean, a very special gig, you know, with Sharon Ward kind of supporting you and working with you. I think, but we're going to have you back, and um, we'll find a way. <laughs> we we'll find a way, whatever way possible, to ha have you back very, very soon. But thanks a million for doing this, and you're, you've got one of the most incredible voices and incredible live, live acts oh. kind of that has happened much. In, in the past number of years. So many, many more years to come, even. Thanks a million for, 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 for thanks, being. Thanks, Mark. Thanks for having me. All right.